China recently announced extreme poverty has been eliminated within its borders. How is this accomplished? And given this humanitarian success, among others, why is China portrayed so inhumanely in the West where poverty and other humanitarian violations continue to worsen? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. I mean, it, it really comes, really, the anti-poverty uh, program, the, the poverty alleviation drive in China was funded and organized by the state and by the Communist Party. I mean, without those two elements, a socialist state and a Communist Party, none of those achievements could have been possible. And that's why you see where poverty alleviation is in the lead anywhere in the world. That's who's in the, I mean, that's who's in front of it. It same goes for Laos, same goes for Vietnam, very similar achievements. And honestly, basically the same kind of development model, this idea that socialism needs to be built, right? You can't just uh, jump to the second stage of socialism, AKA communism, without building up the material foundations for it. So mm -hmm. the poverty alleviation campaign went hand in hand with ensuring that China as a whole had the material resources, had the relationships with countries around the world to be able to put in the kind of infrastructure that it takes to raise people's standard of living. And the Communist Party in their cadres did all of the heavy lifting. I mean, dozens of Communist Party members died in these remote areas because of the dangerous conditions that so many rural populations faced in places like Gansu province that, um, you know, at any given time, things like, uh, you know, the collapse of, uh, you know, muddy fixtures and, you know, certain kinds of hazardous conditions at any time could pose a threat to your very existence. And, and so these cadres went to the villages and they brought with them the funds and the resources that the state has been able to accumulate over time. The poverty alleviation campaign um, China spent more money on that in a country where per capita income is still just a fifth of the United States, right? I think um, it's 10,000 now in China. It's still over 50,000 in the United States, but they spent more on this campaign than the United States spends on education here in this country publicly, right? That's a huge deal. The United States has so much resources at disposal. It's stolen so much from the world, but it can't use those resources to invest in quality education. China was investing the money that it has accumulated from international um, relations and cooperation with uh, capitalist and socialist countries alike to ensure that these cadres had what they needed. So when they went to the villages, they could ensure that people had health care. They could ensure that they um, had the clothing that they needed and that they did a real targeted response to various conditions that existed across the country because not everywhere is the same. That's the thing about China. It's this huge country where in some regions, we're talking about arid, completely arid, mountainous, especially in the West, the mountainous, cold, um, extremely extreme shifts in temperatures um, across seasons that require a real thought into how are you going to raise the income that's coming in for the populations that live there. And uh, the cadres basically went out to these villages. They went to places like Xinjiang, like uh, the villages that exist in that region. And they worked with them to study what's, what's happening here. What is missing, right? Is it the fact that they're missing technology? Are they missing some certain technology that it takes to farm a certain way? Is it that what they are farming is inefficient? Do we need to switch the kind of crops that they're farming so it fits more with the national economy and it also fits better with the conditions of that particular environment? All of these things were considered and people themselves who live in these villages had a heavy hand in determining this, right? Determining who's actually in poverty in this village, who needs certain things over others, who's disabled, who can't work, who needs just income to survive, they can't contribute, so they need social security. All of that was part of this organizational model of poverty alleviation, and it worked, and it was very, and it's been very successful. We've seen incomes go from sometimes as low as, you know, 50 to $100 annually, people making US dollars annually, 
to increasing their incomes 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, sometimes 40 times um, a- their annual income, which with all of the subsidization of things like infrastructure and things like healthcare that occurred in these villages uh, really lifted people up very fast. We're talking about going from 98 million people in poverty uh, just, um, you know, just 15 years ago to zero today, right? And 800 million since 1978. Mm-hmm. That's extremely impressive. So uh, you, you can't, you, you can't really distort that. You, you, you can try. I mean, NPR has tried. These various, uh, the Economist has tried to demonize what this is. I mean, you can't really. The World Bank and the UN wanted this. This is part of the Millennium Development Goals, all of it, right? You can't, you can't demonize this unless you have a real imperialist, ranchivist perspective on China and a policy agenda. Uh, but they've tried. They've tried to say that it's communist controlled and they're making people so miserable by going into these villages and, and, and strengthening the party in these villages and telling people how they should live and, and all of this nonsense when in fact, I mean, the legitimacy of the Communist Party of China has gone way up because of poverty allevi- alleviation because it's what people want. People don't want to die at 35 of, commu- of communicable diseases they don't want to be hungry every day. They don't want to live in substandard housing where at any moment uh, it could you know, collapse on itself because of certain climates, right? Um, and it, but, but there is an adjustment too to it, right? Because some, some of these folks were living in these substandard conditions for generations. And it's hard to get used to urban life. That's the new challenge, right? It's hard to get new, used to having these things met. And... Um, you know, now living a different kind of life. Now you're going from almost feudal-like conditions to more industrialized conditions, living in an apartment, running a business, all of this very, um, it's almost like a culture shock in some ways. So yeah, there's some mm-hmm. resistance, but in mass, it's a wildly popular thing. And the way, and to demonize China, you have to, around this, you have to basically focus on these very, old but rehashed new cold war anti-communist tropes that paint china as some sort of quote-unquote authoritarian dictatorship which only has as its objective uh, is this kind of brainwashing and control over the population right this kind of puppet strings mentality where this quote that i read from uh, a piece by joshua rogan in the post where he said that there's a joke in DC where when China says win-win, what it means is actually that China wins twice, right? Because win-win cooperation is a, is, is a big slogan uh, for the way that China deals with other countries. But really the joke in Washington is, oh, that's just China saying they want to win two times, not just one. So there is this built-in and ingrained mentality that China is an enemy and that everything it does is dastardly and has at its core a suppression of human rights and the suppression of the people's wants and democrat quote unquote democratic desires but the core of democracy i think and i think this is what socialists have always understood real socialists and that's what all these socialist countries have understood democracy starts at where what people need it starts at your material the material basis of existence. So Vietnam, China, the DPRK, what they've all said is electoral democracy, that's procedural. China says this, Zhang Weiwei, uh, one of their big scholars says, that's procedural democracy. Sure, you can vote for a politician, but that politician is owned by corporations and they just do what corporations want. No, what really matters is how are you organized? If you are in control, if you are politically in control, how are you organized to ensure that people can exist and then thrive. And and that's what these countries have been dealing with. That's what they've been trying to address. They've been trying to address, well, how do you get out of a hundred years of uh, humiliation at the hands of foreign powers like Japan and uh, and Britain, Vietnam? How do you get out of hundred years, almost a hundred years of colonialism and then to be bombed into the stone age? How do you, get out of those conditions that are sowed by that. 
and right. ensure that people's needs are met. Well, you do it. First of all, you do it in a very centralized way because you got to do it fast. Because if you don't do it fast, people die. People live in substandard conditions for too long. And that's why you see these, these countries trying their best with what, they, with what they have and what is available to them and whatever kind mm-hmm. of arrangements and partnerships they can make around the world to speed up the process of prosperity and the accumulation of wealth in order to have a foundation for socialism. Because we didn't come into, a lot of these revolutions didn't come into prosperous conditions. It wasn't like the old saying that uh, Europe was gonna go socialist back in the 20th century and that was what gonna, was gonna lead the world. That didn't happen. And, and a lot of these capitalist countries just became more and more imperialist, more and more concentrated and more and more anti-communist while the rest of the world tried their best to move in a socialist direction and those that succeeded found themselves isolated in so many ways. And so this is what people don't want to talk about because it means you have to humanize people. It means people in Vietnam, people in China, uh, their governments have to be humanized as well. This is what people have to understand too. You can't say, oh, the government and the people, you know, the people are, we support people the are government. Not their government. We don't, yeah, they're not their government, right? Well, uh, they're, 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 91, they are. <laughs> there are 91 million members of the Communist Party of China. Most yeah. of them have families. If, you're, if you know anyone who's Chinese or if you know anyone, if you've ever have any kind of relationship or studied anything about China, families are a big deal. So everyone, has, most, most people have families, very few people have families. So that means that you have a large portion of the population. They're members of the Communist Party. And those who aren't, everyone has relationships, whether it's, you know, cooperative or whether it's, you know, procedural or administrative, everybody, like you, you, you can't, like, you can't not have some kind of relationship um, at some level. So that means you're demonizing the people. And we have that Harvard Ash Center study that shows that even these bourgeois polls, these surveys show that the legitimacy of the Communist Party is really high in China. Now, mm-hmm. Like over 90% of people are satisfied with what the Communist Party of China is doing. Less than 40% of people in the United States are satisfied with what the federal government is doing. Right. Let's, let's that, like that, that should tell us that, something. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that should tell us something. I think that's, that's a sign of a failed state here. I don't know. <laughs> the same goes for all these other and countries. And not a democracy. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah. it's it's a clear that we were ruled by the uh, capital here. And it's obviously China is representing the people. It's a people's government the people. Yeah. Uh, and, and, that's, and look, I mean, you know, I think that all of these countries have their own ways of de- you know, organizing from the local to the le- you know, level to the provinces, all of it, right. Their own way of having a centralized party as well as having, you know, peop- involvement of people who are not in the party or in the, you know, whatever it is, there are all kinds of different ways of doing that. And we see that across the socialist world in Cuba, it's different from how it is done in China. But at the end of the day, there is a big need to just understand how what we are told about how countries should organize themselves that, it, that that this idea that everything needs to be some sort of haven for the free market and we need to have electoral democracy everywhere um, in the way that it is organized in the UK or in the United States that that's an outmoded way of thinking right even those what I find really ironic is that those who push for social democracy let's say in the United States right people want and then people get fed up with the Democratic Party and they say, we need a third party. Well, if you want power, that third party is going to have to be in power. Does that mean you want the Republicans and the Democrats to be with you in power? Probably not, because if the Democrats and Republicans are in power, they have all of the concentrated capital that comes with that, which means they have influence and you don't. The Green Party, the Movement for People's Party, they're never going to have that. So what are you going to do practically? Political power. Which exactly, which is why these revolutionary situations, which are much different, of course, in China and Vietnam, their histories, right? There had to be, and people got to have to get this out into their mind. I think in the West, in the United States, there had to be a level of suppression. You can't have liberation 
without some level of suppression. You can't allow forces that want to overthrow your government, that want to destroy your society, have real political power. Maybe, I mean, China has some in the universities and in the government, you know, that they'll tolerate, you know, for the sake of reform and opening up or whatever, but they can't have real power over the direction of the state. They, they, they can't be the ones in the vanguard because what ends up, what ends up happening? Well, we see it. We saw what happened in Chile in 1973. A lot of that was because it was a social democratic socialist arrangement and they had a lot of forces inside of it that were literally organizing to assassinate the leader and the leading revolutionary force in that country. And they succeeded right so all of these other countries vietnam china the dprk they are organized to ensure that is not going to happen right that there's no i i mean there's not going to be a so-called color revolution in china people can dream and they can dream about it but it's not going to happen because there are mechanisms in place to prevent it that's the only way you protect people if you want democracy you want real people uh people's movement uh, and, and people's participation in things, there needs to be a level of protection from the aggressors internally mm -hmm. and externally. There are that. This, this needs to be in people's minds, but because there is this fetish of procedural, uh, really white, it's like white man's democracy. It's this idea that you, you, um, you need to have a representative figure that you elect directly and that's how you organize power. That's not how you organize power. If you want a new political party in the United States that represents the interests of workers, you're not gonna be able to coexist with a party that's completely embedded with Wall Street and the military industrial complex. They're gonna destroy you. Uh, I mean, I mean for, they've, they've done it in the past. They've destroyed yeah. movements. They've destroyed political parties that try to do that. Look what happened to the Communist Party USA. And they weren't even at a point where they could challenge the electoral arrangements in this country, but they were still squashed by, you know, the subversion of the state. So it's, it's really important to understand why these countries, yeah, they, they have surveillance. They have, um, they have a level of protection and defense mechanisms. The DPRK needs nuclear weapons. If it didn't have nuclear weapons, we might've had a second, uh, you know, military invasion of Korea, of the DPRK by this point. Who's yeah. to say not? Bill Clinton, he was a hawk towards the DPRK, uh, it, you know, more so even in some respects than George W. Bush was. So you know, despite the fact that he put them on the axis of evil, you know, like, like they're that's a that's a real possibility for these countries and not going to let it happen again. 1975 wasn't that long ago when Vietnam uh, liberated itself from the U.S. dropping more bombs than it did on Germany alone on a country, you know, a fraction of the size. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I think a lot of people don't understand that rights like freedom of speech or or, you know, and, you know, you name it. Uh, they're, they're all it's all based on the level of economic development and political stability in class society. People need to understand that rights are not an eternal thing. Uh, and they, they, they don't exist in a vacuum. Like we can't separate the uh, economic from the political form. I yeah, that, really that's exactly thing. right. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, there is this need. I think, I think whenever we're talking about socialist countries, there's this uh, almost this knee jerk reaction where Vietnam, authoritarian dictatorship, China, authoritarian dictatorship, DPRK, hermit kingdom, crazy cuckoo uh, Korean, you know, workers party, uh, you know, whipping, whipping women and flogging women in the streets, like crazy uh, extreme racist caricatures like this. And it is embedded in this belief that even if the United States is at this uh, moment, this almost apex of its hypocrisy of the myths of the American exceptionalism being completely exposed for everybody to see no one, you know, can say that that's not the case, right? Regardless of where class you are, where you are in the world, that at some level has been imbued in people's consciousness. The United States, that's a hip, you know, they don't practice what they preach. Even with that, still there is this impetus and it's, and it, there's a racial element to this. There's a definitely a racist element to this. Uh, there's an imperialist element to this. It's almost like, okay, yeah, we're not, 
we're, we're, we're not doing what we should be doing. The, this country isn't what it says it is. But those countries over there should be doing what we're doing. They, sh- they should have exactly the same kind of model as we have because it is superior, right? We have these superior values. We capitalist values are superior values. And those values should be practiced by the entire world because that would make the world a better place. Well, what we see now is that, and I think that's why there is this extreme aggression towards China is that for the first time in history, unlike the Soviet Union, which never was really able to break the tech gap, the technology gap, the gap in resources and development between the, you know, it did grow faster than the United States and the capitalist world for a long time. But it, because it was so cut off and because it was so isolated for a while, it couldn't really developmentally surpass the West or the United States, you know, and, and key, especially in consumer goods. And that was a big thing. That's a big deal. If you can't, if you can't break that, then, you know, uh, there is a, there is always an opportunity to try to work in these anti-communist ideas because people have things that you don't have. And, and that, and that creates some real gaps in political understanding, right? If the, the material form always runs along with the political form, as you said, Eric. So China now for the first time is is doing this, right? It is moving for the first time in human history, a socialist country is th- is threatening to surpass economically in all realms, not just growth wise. It's not just the growth. It's the fact that that growth is leading to surpassing the United States in, in things like high technology and infrastructure development. And uh, that's showing that this model of capitalist development, which is rooted in this parliamentary and so-called representative state, uh, eventually leads to a, a complete exposure of its limits, of the limits of what that can do. It can build, right? And we have to acknowledge that capitalism did advance science. It did advance some of these th- you know, human development markers, even as it you know, immiserated much of the planet. It, off the backs of that immiseration did build this uneven development that mainly benefited the US and West. But now we're seeing a kind of collision course toward the opposite trend And I think that's what is really at the heart of why things like the poverty alleviation campaign freak the United States out so much, because it's it's almost as if, well, if China is able to move towards this idea of getting rid of relative poverty and then getting rid of poverty altogether, Mm -hmm. then China no longer has the capacity to become a, uh, you know, a puppet of the United States. It no longer can do that because people in China and its government will never be convinced that the U.S. and the Western way of life is something that is desirable because Ch- the Chinese model has done what the U.S. and West could do and has left out some of those other things like the need to invade and expand and destroy other countries, plunder other countries, uh, you know, the, the need to racially attack a certain population and extract everything from it. It's almost so ironic that that has to be projected upon mm-hmm. China by the U.S. and West in order to try to convince people that that's actually what's happening. Adrian Jen- right, Zeng right. published you were re- this wacky report about yeah. uh, cotton picking in Xinjiang. And then you look more deeply into it. It's like, oh, you mean you mean those workers in Xinjiang who are getting paid 300 a week, and, you know, yuan a week and have their housing subsidized and are yeah. working in legitimate factories and are making more money than they've ever made in the past. And they're doing it all because... It's part of this overall campaign to develop that extremely destitute part of the countryside. Oh, oh, you mean that kind of cotton picking? Oh, totally the mm-hmm. same thing as stealing a people, uh, you know, facing their culture, racially, and yeah, like racially marking them, them, killing yeah. them, torturing them, yeah. uh, you know, exploiting their free labor and then rendering them completely wealthless all the way up until 2020 the same the same the same thing is happening right. there right that's what adrian zenz is insinuating <laughs> you recently um shared a video of your time in a um and where uyghurs were like dancing to a song um in their very own language even i thought there was a cultural genocide happening are you sure you were in china again <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah. You know, I've been meaning to share that video for a long time. Uh, I've just had it in in the um, 
my my wife had all of the photos because she took all of them because I'm terrible at that <laughs> in the videos. But yeah, you know, there's this interesting guy that I love on Facebook that everyone should follow, Jesse Dang, who um, Jesse J E S S I um, Dang D E N G. He he posts all sorts of. I got the idea to post it because he posts all these TikTok videos from Xinjiang and from everywhere in China. Uh, especially around this issue of like, you know, Muslim oppression. And he makes all of these very funny jokes and, and ironic captions that I think people who are anti-imperialists and, and who do not believe this narrative of cultural genocide in Xinjiang will enjoy very much. And it just, I was just like, oh, I got to post this video. I completely forgot about it. And yeah, no, there's, <laughs> it, it, you know, it brings me back. I'm coming up to the year point where I was getting ready to go there. I think, you know, a week from today, as we're recording, I was, heading out and then right towards the end of the trip we spent three days in Arumchi and you know that was at the Grand Bazaar and you know everywhere it's so funny you know uh Jinjing Li of, Sing of CGTN brought up how the money in China you know the yuan the RMB the dollars have all of the they have like five six different languages alone on their translating that this I think it's like five or six biggest language spoken in China on the money well, what do you have in the United States? You have these white slave owner guys who, you know, committed genocide uh, against native people. And, uh, you know, all of this are on the back of our dollars. But in China, you know, there is attention to the fact that not one language is spoken. And you saw that in, in Arumchi as well. You saw yeah. multiple languages, the Uyghur language, the Kazakh language. They were dancing language. in front of a mosque. There was a mosque. Yeah, like, yeah that, was, <laughs> that, was the the mosque. that was the big one. Yeah, and they have a huge yeah. minaret, which is a big tourist attraction. The minaret is beautiful that you saw as we were looking up. We walked up that. It's, oh my God, it's a very long walk, but it's a beautiful minaret and yeah no there's there's mosques everywhere in a room sheet it's very yeah. hard not to yeah. pass one but people if you want to send us some of those if, if you want to send us some of those pictures and videos that we could like yeah we only montage that was over. The only video we took but we do have more pictures I, i'm trying to get them for my wife i definitely will send some um they're not you know uh, unfortunately uh, i wish we had more time there the grand bazaar yeah. is a really interesting thing because it is all it's like it's so multi-ethnic and mm -hmm. you know the a big the kazakh people are a huge population there too so it's yeah. almost like you feel like you're in the middle east too like because it's a different part of china it's the western china right. borders right. afghanistan it borders all of these uh you know states that were created out of the the fall of the soviet union so um a lot of ethnic groups from from those parts of the world have been living in xinjiang or I think ages. it's I think it's so fascinating like like the 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 western media just talked about China as if it's like this this monolithic Han Chinese culture and it's like like that's the racism like yeah. they're, they're creating a class of Chinese people that doesn't exist they've got they've got 50 what 53 recognized ethnic groups in China like yeah, it is yeah, not yeah. just one group and and like liberals are so convinced that the the Chinese government is after this like like this minority um, where there just happens to be a significant trade route for the the Belt Road Initiative. Yeah, um, yeah. all these natural resources, you know, it's like <laughs> it. it um, but like the the we Chinese or the we Muslim people, like yep. they're like if if China wanted to stamp out Muslims, like why are why just that one group and not the rest of them like yeah. you, you really have to one like questions you want to ask that get you labeled as like an extremist like i like it is so crazy trying to talk to some people about this um yeah. and yeah and you could like you see all these pictures and all these images of of people dancing in the street like singing their song there's a whole playlist on spotify of, of music yeah. from Xinjiang in the uyghur language Yep. And even in like these BBC expose videos, like there's Arabic script all over the walls and above the doors, like right underneath the, the Mandarin Chinese. Yep. And like, yep. like you have to, like when I saw that, I was like, what am I looking at right now? Because you're trying to tell me that something really terrible is happening. And then like, um, like even the Guardian was, was like, like sharing stuff, like, like a, like a picture like an aerial shot of, of a building that existed that no longer existed and like this is yeah. a mosque and the Chinese government tore it down it's like how do we know that they're like how do we know how do you know that 
can you show me that this was a, a mosque or like yeah yeah like how, how is it how do we know that this wasn't built by like saudi money with <laughs> you know like anyway yeah well you can uh, definitely follow this jesse dang on facebook because he oh, has amazing material just all over social media you know from everywhere in the region yeah. Uh, even in places like Xi'an, where there's a huge Muslim population, right? Just showing just that kind of diversity that exists in China. And it's so interconnected. And it's so important how and these socialist countries are very interconnected too. Like mm -hmm. uh, if it wasn't for the Korean forces, these were Korean people. And there's still a lot of ethnic Korean people who live in China. If it wasn't for them uh, being deployed by China after the revolution to fight on the side of the uh, Korean People's Army, we might not have had the outcome that we had uh, during the Korean War, where the US was forced to come to a stalemate, right? So, so it's important to realize that these ethnic groups, they are very connected to um, the rest of the region and that China is a very interconnected place as well. It's so ironic, this idea that uh, China is supposedly destroying cultures and, in, in, you know, it's, it's not just Xinjiang, it's like Tibet, it's every, you know, it's any non-Han Chinese, Chinese group, but yet these same people support very racist anti-Han Chinese forces coming out of Hong Kong, which have a long history in being rooted in the reactionary, counter-revolutionary mentality that's been built there from just decades and decades and decades of plunder from colonial forces from actual colonial forces mm -hmm. from from mm -hmm. britain right that that's what's so ironic is that there is also a lot of racism towards han chinese people actually a lot of this yellow peril racism is toward han chinese it's it it's it's the, 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 to think that han chinese are superior in some way especially when we're thinking about in global terms mm -hmm. is, is ridiculous and then to not understand that when you have so many ethnic groups, you also have, you may have a Han majority, but these are very powerful minorities, which you wouldn't be able to govern or society. And actually prior to the revolution in China, there wasn't much governance going on. You know, there was a lot of divisions and that's why China was so weak. They, they couldn't unify into a nation. Now, now they're calling it a civilization, but couldn't even, uh, unify into a nation with any sort of comprehensive agenda and plan. It was warlords going at it over certain territories aligned with certain imperial forces and whatnot, while uh, the country was left in this complete and utter misery. And in particular, ethnic groups like the Uyghur population were uh, in a, a, a deep state of oppression. I mean, look, and, and in Tibet as well. I mean, the way that the people in Tibet were treated by the lamas and the, the, the warlords that ruled over them prior to the revolution is completely, and prior to 1959 even, because it took 10 years to, to even address that situation in any comprehensive way. And for the people there, right? There was a real self-determination position taken after the revolution in Tibet. Like we got to figure out how to integrate it, but we also have to make sure that people have the autonomy to figure out what that's going to be like and it took mm -hmm. a, a real rebellion right that that happened multiple rebellions leading to a big rebellion all the way till 1959 for even tibet to be really integrated into china so it is this it's a very disingenuous it's a very racist outlook that uh somehow china isn't attentive to these issues um and ironically you have some of the darlings, right? Like this new Tibetan, not Tibetan, um, Taiwanese government, right? This new government in Taiwan of the DPB, the Democratic Progressive Party. You have them banning Chinese history books. The idea, you, you have them banning the revolutionary history of China. Um, you have them trying to um, eradicate certain languages and, and this kind of thing, but, but no word about that, right? Because they're serving a particular agenda. They're taking US weapons, right? Uh, in the billions of dollars. They're serving a very separatist goal of weakening China. So, you know, the Taiwan authorities and, and that political party, that's, that's okay. 
that's the same thing in Hong Kong when they passed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act and the Hong Kong Autonomy Act and all of these acts. It's like, it's okay that there's this blatant interference in China and that there is this real kind of de scenification going on. That's really what it is. It's this de scenification of these key parts of China. That's all right, as long as it serves the prerogatives of the United States. When it doesn't, like the Belt and Road Initiative, like the poverty alleviation campaign, then it's cultural genocide, right? That, that's, that's when it's cultural genocide. When, when we are seeing that these certain ethnic groups in the territories that they live in are so key to our, uh, uh, our need to uh, contain the rise of China. And, and that's really at the root of, of all of this. Yeah, um, Danny, our, our last question we have for you, it, it, it's kind of a big one. So hopefully we, uh, if, if, any, if I need to repeat anything, just let me know. Um, so let's, let's talk about the difference between democratic socialism versus actual socialism. And let's also address the theme am, among ultra leftists here where, where they claim that China is not socialist, uh, which I find to be very a, a very mind-blowing talking point because if one reads the communist manifesto it explains why it indeed is socialist so why does this theme persist and how do we get the left in our imperial core to join in solidarity with socialist states and fight against the cold war propaganda and also let's also talk about um, vietnam and, and laos and how their socialist system functions yes 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 okay this is a very big question. So yeah. first, Vietnam and Laos. It's so interesting because I know that Vietnam and China are still dealing with very sensitive issues that go a long way, the Sino-Soviet split, all of that. So there is a, a, a hope and there's a lot of cooperation now, uh, economically, especially that uh, stronger ties will build. And, um, you know, I, I really do hope that. But, but I think that it's so interesting that Laos, China, and Vietnam have all embraced a very similar model. A very similar model. You can read the ways that their communist parties and their media, etc., talk about socialism, and they're all reading the same documents. It's obvious. They're all reading Marx in the same way. They're privileging Marx really than they're privileging others. They're saying Marx is the economic doctrine, right? Lenin, Mao, etc., they, they had a lot of ideological strength and, and, and are very important. But for this moment, for the last, especially 40-ish years, I know Laos and Vietnam have been a little less in terms of the opening up and reform, but it, it, circa around 40 years, all three of these countries have embraced socialism with market characteristics, I'll call it, or market social, and people call it market socialism. Um, and it's really a model of allowing state enterprises, state-owned enterprises, allowing kind of more socialist forms of organizations, mass organizations, cooperatives, et cetera, to coexist with private forms of development. And a lot of the private forms of development, um, while there is foreign direct investment, that's a big, that's a key thing. That's probably the most key thing for these countries, right? How do you get foreign direct investment? But ensure that that foreign direct investment is not uh, dictating the terms of your society. That's really what socialism in a lot of ways is being interpreted in these countries. And so how they do that is, yes, there is foreign direct investment, but it cannot be um, uneven development. It can't be that China, Vietnam, Laos, that they're going to engage in relations with Europe or the United States or anywhere else um, Australia, whoever it is, uh, and allow for there not to be a deal where people are protected, right? People's rights, people's enshrined rights to their needs, their basic needs, and the development objectives of the country are not respected, right? Because yeah, if you let Nike have a factory in your country, and then you let Nike take repatriate, you know, a majority of those profits out of the country, and you have Nike uh, politically influencing um, the state through whatever it is, then you're, you're, you're going to have some trouble. But that's not allowed in these countries, right? right. Um, there is a, a real commitment to ensuring that there is uh, these private forms of investment come in, but it serves the national 
agenda. And we see that in so many different ways, right? One of the big projects that China and Laos have been engaged with is the China Lao uh, Railway. And that, that has been in, you know, under construction for many years. And it's going to be an economic corridor for these two countries. And it's going to really integrate both of them and create um, a real outlet for a country like Laos, which um, was bombed to the Stone Age, like Vietnam, yeah. and where the secret war that the CIA waged there mm -hmm. devastated the country. The chemical warfare affected them as well. The United States didn't just drop it on Vietnam. It dropped it everywhere. The Ho Chi Minh Trail connecting Vietnam and Laos um, was a huge target of some of the most egregious and heinous military crimes. So the poverty that exists in Laos and Vietnam, right, a fraction of the size of China even economically, um, is still something that is being addressed. And, and it's been addressed really well. I mean, over half of Laos was in extreme poverty after the uh, revolution there and after the, uh, after the United States was ejected from the region. Now it's uh, in the single digits. You know, extreme poverty is in the single digits and people are increasingly becoming more confident in their ability to make real money and to invest in real opportunities for themselves, as well as uh, kind of build the foundations for like the China uh, Lao Railway, which will uh, inevitably bring even more opportunities for development. So development is really the goal in all three of these countries. And some people see that as quote unquote revisionist. Some people see it as a a rejection of socialism, but they haven't read Marx because Marx talks about the primary stage of socialism. And he says, when you overthrow capitalism, you have to deal with the old issues. You have to deal with what you inherit, right? Mm -hmm. You inherit as a revolution, all the problems of the old society and how do you address those? Well, um, for a poor underdeveloped country where uh, more than half of each of these countries was illiterate after each of their revolutions, where you have so much devastation from wars like in Vietnam and, uh, and in Laos, where you have uh, so much experience with things like opium trading and, um, you know, uh, sex slavery, all of these very pertinent issues, right? I was reading something that Vietnam inherited a country you know, full of people who had been pauperized, right? After 1975, the majority of the country had lost everything. They lost their homes. They lost their jobs. They lost their farms. <laughs> like, what was the biggest target of U.S. bombs? It was the fields. It was the agricultural uh, lifeline of the country. So, what do you do? You go right to social. You go right to communism and say everybody is equal, and we have to, um, you know, uh, make sure that everyone uh, is seen as the same. No, you need to generate real economic activity and you need to and, and you need to do it fast and, and each country has their experience of trying to be very um because of the soviet union and china and the big social the ideological power of the proletarian international like there was this drive to try there was an attempt i mean china tried cultural revolution was a lot about that tried to institute uh move forward right skip socialism skip uh, capitalist development. Vietnam tried to do it too. Skip capitalist development. Uh, uh, they're so interconnected, but each country found that if you do that, you're, you're going to be in trouble because your country doesn't have all that it needs. It can't operate in isolation. You can't rebuild a country without real material resources. And so we've seen through, uh, through uh, Doi Moi reform, through uh, reform and opening up in China, we've seen a real emphasis on, okay, we need roads, we need bridges, we need, we need industrial development. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not, a, we're not countries run by what really is a regressive model of uh, living out in the countryside like we did in the uh, you know colonial period or in the semi-feudal period of our development, people can't live like this and expect that socialism will survive. And so this right. key moment when the Soviet Union fell uh, was also a key lesson, I think, to all of these countries, which is, well, 
you know, we need to make sure that we're integrated in the world economy so we can fi figure out how to develop the primary stage of socialism with all of the resources that we can get. And so that's what's been really driving this growth that we see. This is why Vietnam, Laos, China don't really go through economic crises because they allow the state and the state-owned enterprises to be the protective force of the overall economy. And then the private forms of development help generate uh, you know, resources, infrastructure development, technological know-how, all of this so that uh, the society can move forward mm -hmm. in a way which won't just you know, keep people wanting you know, uh, just basic things, but gets people to see that the fruits of socialism bear even more kinds of prosperity, like, like individual prosperity and collective prosperity. Like now we don't ride uh, horse-drawn carriages, now we drive electric vehicles, you know? Like, like now we're not, you know, um, riding these horse-drawn carriages across the country. Uh, now we're in high-speed rails, you know? Now we're drive, you know, we're going on high-speed rail from one end of the country to another in a fraction of the time. Like that's real progress that is tangible to see and it really does help to strengthen um, along with the real hard work that has to be done in combating the, the mechanism, the forces of capitalism, which do come with ideological costs. And no one will uh, deny that, you know, or at least uh, anyone with principles won't deny that there are costs of uh, dealing with capital and capitalism inside of your country. But that's why there are things like anti-corruption campaigns in both Vietnam and China. That's why uh, they, you- They think ex billionaires yeah, that's why you have these severe punishments of those who commit crimes. That's why you have this in China. There is this endless cycle of local administrative change because locally, that's where a lot, you know, it's easy. Someone told me in China, it's easy for the National People's Congress to come up with the ideas and then to say, here's the plans, go implement them to the provinces and then downward to the municipalities. But then it's where the municipalities where they have to enact them. And that's where things can get dicey. And that's why you see this kind of cycling of local administrations because the plans don't always get implemented. And there are elements, you know, when you do allow capitalism to have some say in your society, it does lead to things like corruption. And that's why um, you, gotta, you gotta stamp it out. We saw that with the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, it's questionable whether Wuhan's authorities did anything wrong, but even the perception meant that something had there was some communication lever that wasn't good enough and that administration that local administration was deposed in a second and and, and that's what we saw and, and so that i think just explains this primary stage of socialism this idea that you have people building socialism to each according to their labor so people are paid differently and compensated differently based on their labor Yes. But you do not have what you have under capitalism, which is really to each according to whatever they're able to steal for themselves and then pr privately develop. You don't have that in these countries. It's not allowed. You can't um, you can't do that in China. You know, you'll be in real trouble if you, uh, you know, try to do that. Uh, once you're caught, you're you're in trouble. Vietnam, the same way. You know, you you can't operate as an individual capitalist. And that's why they're always complaining in the financial times. Oh God, the state owns everything. Oh my gosh, I can't do anything. It's because there are these mechanisms in place to protect. Get your shit with that proletariat. I don't like any yeah, time. Oh my, you know, it's, it's always the same. It's like, oh, you, you, you think that there's a real private industry in China? No, there isn't. That's wrong. And it's because they know that yeah, China prioritizes foreign direct investment, especially in consumer good, in consumer goods. But uh, guess what? Uh, there is this state-owned uh, inf enterprise infrastructure which allows for real protections and allows for these companies to be kept in check in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and we're seeing that now. We're seeing the pushback. It's like, yes, you gave us something. Now we've absorbed it. And now... We, we want you to stick around because we want to absorb more of what you have to offer. 
But if you leave, we'll try to do it ourselves. We see it with how they've reacted to the sanctions on the semiconductors that the United States has imposed. And that's a big deal because China's not there yet. They can't, they don't have a domestic uh, infrastructure to just produce that themselves. But they're going to try now because they've built up a capacity to where they can respond in that way and say, okay, you'll do this to us. Uh, it may hit us. It may, it may slow down some things, but we'll do it ourselves now because cooperating and being able to develop um, on equal terms with the world and with the West and the United States in a lot of ways has helped that uh, Japan, et cetera, even, you know, all these so-called adversaries have helped China get where it needs to go. And that was part of how you build socialism in a market oriented and dominated. The lesson of the Soviet Union was capitalism right now is dominant. And we, you know, there needs to be adjustments. Doesn't mean you overthrow the system, but there needs to be adjustments. So all these Vosh and, you know, all these folks that want to say that um, it's not socialism is, is degrading. And, and it really delegitimizes, I think, uh, uh, first of all, nearly two billion people who yeah. have um, who have talking about races, yeah, who have built societies for their own needs um, and have built socialism based on what they see as their own conditions and how they interpret Marxism and Marxist doctrine for their own conditions, um, and really just exposes how, first of all, the left in the United States and the West hasn't had a revolution. They haven't built anything. They actually haven't won anything. I mean, there have been uh, valiant struggles and uh, most of the people who led those are not the ones championing these kind of heinous and, and egregious uh, racist epithets towards socialism in these countries. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge this we have to be we have to have some humility we have not had a socialist revolution we can't dictate the terms of how uh socialist countries are going to build their societies uh, we have to focus on how can we learn not only stop viewing these countries as enemies but then how can we learn from them understanding that they're way different based on the unevenness of how all this has transpired but we still have to learn yes. from the principles right because the United States is going to run into its own kind of, uh, if there is a socialist revolution, whenever that happens, it's going to run into its own market socialist moment where how many centuries have people lived under capitalism here? There's going to be kind of a reckoning of how do you deal with those contradictions? And you're going to want to learn from countries that are doing it right now, right in front of our eyes. And they're doing it with this imperialist monstrosity breathing down their necks, uh, trying to subvert them, trying to divide them, trying to, you know, whisper in Vietnam's ear here, you can have military weapons, trying to say to China, you know, if you, uh, you know, give up this and that, then you can have more from us, uh, all of this, you know, if you give up certain ways of governance, you can, you can be closer to us. It's, it's, there's so much nefarious things going, the DPRK, you know, trying to starve that country with sanctions, all of that. It's all about, um, you know, uh, arresting this, this trend, this, this real trend of what I think is, is hope for the world, because um, right now that part of the world is ahead in so many ways and looking, looking at countries that are so resource rich, but are so embattled right now by imperialism for real cooperation, right? The South South cooperation from China is a, it is a legitimate threat to U.S. interests. I mean, yeah. if, 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 if African countries, if countries in Latin America get their hands on this kind of infrastructure, you know, that, that sows the end of, of the material foundations for the U.S. to be able to build political influence. That political influence will dwindle and dwindle even from those who are attached to the hip to the United States. There will be no, you can't stop. Like, like if you offer railways, technology telecommunications you say even to the most vicious you know and heinous and, and, and most uh, corrupted uh you know officials in countries like uh uganda or anywhere else that hey you know we can connect you to your neighbor and we can do it in the fraction of the time that it takes for what you have now and 
you know, what are you going to say to that? Are you going to say, no, that's not going to help me? Of course it will help. It'll help your, it'll help your legitimacy. And it also will, um, you know, uh, just provide a certain level of stability that most countries in the African world, most countries in Latin America just don't have right now. They don't have that kind of st- political stability. Wait, isn't stability. that imperialism? Oh yeah, doing do, doing business is imperial. It's a total definition of imperial. Uh, that's that's it's so funny how that's been um, mirrored as imperialism. I mean, yeah. doing business with other countries, trying to find ways to both extract benefits from a trade relationship while also uh, offering immense benefits. I mean, Ali Vargas, who spoke at um, our, one of our No Cold War events literally was saying how I couldn't speak. He was at a rally for a uh, movement towards socialism right before the election. And he said in his talk, I would not have this cellular internet capacity outside. He was outside while he was talking. If it wasn't for the relationship between China and Bolivia, if it wasn't for China saying, we will build this infrastructure uh, and then we will, and then you have it, right? If we didn't, if there wasn't this relationship of, okay, we're going to come with this as long as you export something to us that we need. If that didn't happen, then he wouldn't have been able to participate in the event and bring the message of what the movement towards socialism is doing to retake power there to a global audience. And and I think to interpret that as imperialism just shows how bankrupt and and arrogant so many so-called socialists in in, in the West are, that they don't understand that people have real material and objective needs yeah. and that China isn't bringing this material aid and these real business relationships yes but they're not bringing them with the hope of putting them on you know under com- their complete control if that were the case they're not, they're not trying they're, to underdevelop these countries either they're trying no, to help they want build it, no, them China. up and they're Exactly. Like the, yeah. Like the U.S. wants to privatize the the resources and e- extract the the wealth, and and China's like, oh, let's build trains so that you can trade with your neighbors so much better. Like, like that. And if, oh, if you can't if you can't you know pay it back in ten years, well then you know what? We'll just we'll just you can just give us some of this money, and then eventually we'll just write it all off. Like. Yeah, and that's what happens all the time. And that's what China does is they they write off debt all the time to countries that just can't pay it depending on their circumstances and needs. And that's because that's what you do to keep a business relationship. That's what you do. Um, That's how you show solidarity when it's needed. But, you know, back to the question, lastly, about the difference between democratic socialism and socialism. This is the big, the big piece um, for me is that right now we have a we have a very strong uh, at least in terms of numbers, size, size in, in consciousness, democratic socialism, right? It, it, there is an impetus for it. But really what democratic socialism is, is it's really just a movement for social welfare. That's not to say that it doesn't have a good set of demands, that it couldn't be somehow uh, integrated into a real socialist program, but it's not socialism per se. It's really... The democratic social, it's really a moniker for in, in kind of a, a fancy way of saying in a, in a more militant way of saying social welfare, liberalism, right? That's, that's kind of where these movements come out of. Their hero is FDR, who wanted to save capitalism, right? So that is, that's not a socialist movement. But just like the New Deal era, there were a lot of real socialists pushing I mean, like the only reason FDR even influenced the New Deal is because there was a massive uh, movement led in large part by socialists to pressure those kind of reforms. But democratic socialism in the 21st century um, doesn't have that at the base, right? There wasn't a large workers move, movement rooted in workers and militant socialism pushing these folks to the forefront. It's just them, right? It's just it's just the AOCs and the Bernie Sanders. And we're seeing now how this kind of a large mass movement that is um, behind Sanders and AOC, they don't have the leadership. And oftentimes their leaders are anti-communist and, and really against 
uh, socialism right. Right. themselves. Or they could do overthrowing socialist governments. Exactly. Like. Uh, but they use so socialism has become popular in a very positive way because, well, uh, more people want things. They, they, they need, base, they, they want their basic needs met. They don't want to not have health care. They don't want to be in hundreds of thousands of dollars in student debt. They don't want to be paying 50 or more percent of income on rent. They don't want massive homelessness. They don't want crumbling trains. They don't want, uh, you know, they don't want to be destroying the environment. All of this stuff. That's that. Those are real uh, class-based kind of mm -hmm. um, desires. But mm -hmm. democratic socialism uh, in, is that's in the lead of these movements. Uh, sees the struggle for socialism as stabilizing the u.s capitalist economy through reform right it's all about cap the, look at denmark look at whatever new zealand look at these countries uh, people live well they have you know uh, uh real vibrant social security systems and healthcare systems for everybody and so uh we can we can do that too right rokan uh, posts all the time on twitter look at all these western countries and the west is always the model right nowhere outside right. of the west it's always these you know 14 countries or 10 countries mm -hmm. that all have universal health care that's the model and we just need what they have well i mean a lot of these countries got what they got because of working class struggle right a lot of communist parties that do have some parliamentary influence in these countries were really in the lead towards forcing those reforms at a key point. Then the Soviet Union was there saying, uh, we're an example of what could replace you. A lot of these countries said, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you want that healthcare stuff? Yeah, you can have it in order to uh, stabilize the situation and prevent mm -hmm. socialism. There are, there, are, um, there are concessions from the ruling class. Exactly. So. There are concessions from the ruling class. And there are concessions that are not... Uh, necessarily permanent we see in a lot of countries like sweden for example <laughs> look at what they did with covid19 there's been a lot of rollbacks of these things too not everything is great. in the uk yeah they have universal health care but the nhs is being starved and housing costs are through the roof and there is a real rollback austerity just doesn't affect the united states alone even though the united states started from a very low point when austerity became uh the rule of law here so really, that's what democratic socialism is in AOC. And we see now with this Medicare for all forced to vote, they don't even want to take the steps They're They're being so infantile that they don't want to take the steps to even challenge those right. that sit next to them in the ruling class to get these reforms. It's not time yet. There needs to be this procedural thing that needs to happen. We need to do this. No, no, no. We're seeing how social democrats always do this but in the united states right. it's even more acute where we don't even have the infrastructure to push social democrats we don't have the do political power we don't yeah. have the we, we don't, don't have, have the we don't have the the parties yeah to push them yeah to push, them to, push them to do what we want what we said we wanted them to do exactly, exactly. Um, um and yeah so that's that's basically the difference in socialism even though people see it as authoritarian is authoritarian china vietnam laos the difference is is that there is a people there's a party that represents the people and that is made up of the people which has control over the levers of production and development which then allows for those um, aspirations and desires and needs to be fully expressed, or at least as fully as is possible in this moment that we live in. Um, and it's a complete, that's why you have so much emphasis on legitimacy in these countries. It's not, oh, can I vote for, uh, you know, Xi Jinping or something? It's what, what, is, what does Xi Jinping represent for me? Does he, is he fighting against poverty? Is he developing, is he for the development of society? Is he, bringing up our cultural uh, and economic level of existence. Well, if that's true, the Xi Jinping is the leader for me. That is kind of the model, the difference, right? Here in the United States, the government is controlled by billionaires and capitalists, and it's right. wielded for their interests. And in socialist countries, the government is wielded in the interests of people and capitalists and capitalism 
are just a mechanism from which the goals of this government can be realized. And the minute that these goals are being superseded and are being interfered with, that's when you see a real class struggle occur in these uh, societies. And here in the United States, uh, the class struggle has to be between uh, the forces who don't have power, the exploited classes who don't have power, and those who do. And if we elect people through democratic socialism or whatever to uh, supposedly enact some kind of uh, socialist light agenda, then if they're there, then they are they are the same objectively, mm -hmm. right? They're sitting right. in Congress. They sh they need to be held to account. And the educational process has to be, well, if they're not doing what they say they were going to do, then what now? And that's the conversation yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people are going to be having in these, especially <laughs> after this pandemic, right? Right, right. And even, even AOC has admitted that, like, she can only do so much without power um, on the outside to prevent a power vacuum from happening. Because I think a lot of people understand that, um, you know, even if we influence the Democratic Party from the left, um, like you'll create like an easy vacuum will be created without infrastructure on the outside. And like if the if the, the Democratic Party split, half of them would join the Republicans and that would make them even stronger. So, you know, I've been saying it this whole whole primary. People don't like it. You've got to we've got to really, really build um a, like something else outside of it something that that w like a forum like anything anything where we have a specific agenda that speaks to needs of people that isn't movement chasing that isn't um just like a single issue thing um that also like collaborates with people who who are coming at things from the right like conservatives are tired of war too um, con you know, the conservatives support Medicare for all. They, you know, they 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 understand that, like, when you're getting close to being forced to live in a nursing home, that you can't afford it. And what happens? Like, you get you get evicted. Like, we have to start speaking to some of those issues as well um, in order to to build anything substantial. So, um, I think that's a. I think this is great. Um, for us to cut off. Um, do you have anything else to add? Do you have um, anything else on your mind? Um, and can you make sure to tell us again where we can find your work? Sure. So yeah, just real quick, when you were speaking, um, I was just thinking about, you know, we got to get to the moment and it goes back to what Eric said in the beginning of, of, of our uh, conversation. He said, the movement needs to get back to the masses. And I think that's, needs to be the focus and one of the ways we need to do that is is finding a way and all of the some of this won't be uh, possible possible in the objective circumstances at, at a given time or another now or uh, maybe in the near future but how can it how can when will right this will be partly objective in terms of how things change in the u.s and the world as well as what we do right when will there be a real conversation a real debate uh where socialists, communists are not looked at as the enemy, uh, but really as another force from which these social democratic forces can move with and can try to fight to achieve these objectives together, right? Because that's, that's when these real debates happen. Right now, they see us uh, as anathema and they don't even want to touch a lot of people i mean they don't even want to have conversations with jimmy Dore and call him masadist they don't want to be talking to cop they think communists are completely out of the realm of uh, uh of politics right so when does that moment happen and it happens when masses of people are engaged in politics and uh, it's unfortunate that we have a moment where yeah millions of people and these, these you know, they are considered the masses they're not all just these petty bourgeois types the leaders are they're not all vouch types gentrifiers there are a lot of folks who look highly at aoc who look highly at bernie sanders right P workers who are working in some of these very low wage uh, retail and service sector industries so um, it's important that i think in the future we're engaging with the masses and trying to generate this kind of conversation by 
partly doing battle, right? We got to do battle with these forces. We have to, um, we have to find ways to get them to have the conversation. And so uh, I think that's the next step here in this moment, because the, 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 the social democratic movement of Sanders and AOC did not produce a social democratic party. And the only thing, the only way a social democratic party forms is when there is a break from uh, these institutions and a, and a real wrestling with what are these forces that are not even allowing someone like Bernie Sanders to exist um, in a real right. way. Um, so yeah. And, right. and so where you can find me, that's basically um, kind of how I see this next phase and, and making defending socialist countries kind of cool again will come, I think, when there is a, a real threat of, uh, of war between uh, the United States and let's say a China or anywhere else and how that impacts this new rise in consciousness for things like Medicare for all and how we are engaged because we're going to have to be the ones doing the hard grunt work of, of pulling back um, that real impetus to as in the 20th century a lot of the uh you know french communists and socialists and uh around the world as well we're like oh we got to defend our countries right how do we pull back that impetus um to do that uh, will be a big task for us so yeah you yeah. can find me again at um blackagendareport.com each week you can find me on twitter at spirit of ho spirit of h-o and you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Danny Haifang. You can find me on Facebook. And, um, you know, if you follow my Patreon or if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see other places where I'm contributing. Uh, and definitely subscribe to the Left Lens, which is the new Black Agenda Report program that we're trying to do monthly. Um, and, yeah, that's basically where you can find me for now. You may be able to find me in more places in the future. But, uh, yeah, so, so thank you all. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Something something that I hope we can touch on in the future, um, building up what, what you were just saying is um, like Nina Turner and a lot of like the, the Bernie crowd have started this like people's uh, party thing. Yeah. So I'm really, she announced a candidacy for uh, Congress in in Ohio. So I'm, I'm really interested in seeing where that's going, where that's mm -hmm. going to take the working class and how, how we can uh, you know, whether or not we're going to support that or, or if we should be like critical of that. So sure. Um, thank you so much, Danny, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing more of your work. Thank you. Same here. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, we look forward to having you on again soon. Sure thing, guys. Thank you.